I will introduce our first speaker, Greg Ulmer from Lockheed Martin. Greg is the Vice President of Advanced Development Programs, also known as the Skunk Works, which I'm sure that is uh, no, no mystery to you here. And he does operations and production programs at Lockheed up there in Palmdale. <laughs> And he's responsible for overall advanced development programs across multiple sites. And he was named to this position recently. And I'm sure he'll give us insights on what's going on there. And he's been doing a lot of different things um, with cross-functional and cross-program teams and developing air advanced aircraft manufacturing and modification in support of the US and allies around the world. He was with the uh, C5 Vice President Program Manager Program in Marietta. I lived in Atlanta for a while. It's a wonderful okay. place to live. And uh, with no further ado, Greg, I'd invite you to come up and share exciting things about Lockheed. Well, thank you. Um, even though I did come from Marietta, I was born and raised in California. Actually, uh, fifth generation Californian. My grandfather used to say, if you're not three generations, you need to leave the state. <laughs> I don't know how many folks would be left in the state of California, but I'm very proud. I also went to Cal Poly SLO, a little shameless plug for SLO, as an aerospace engineer uh, at the time. So what I'd like to do today is just get a general overview of Skunk Works. We we'll call it Skunk Works 101. And the first thing I'd like to do is show you about a three and a half minute video, and then I'll kind of step through my charts with you. Here you have very challenging problems where a lot of people would say that's too difficult or that's too hard, but at the Skunk Works, the response is, I don't know the answer, but we'll figure it out. The Skunk Works is a, a risk tolerant place, and being risk tolerant, we're encouraged to find unique solutions. There's a tolerance for failure. Uh, if you have an opportunity to fail, you have an opportunity to learn. Being able to create an environment like that, you're able to go a leap ahead or a a couple leaps ahead in, in technology because you're encouraged to look beyond the next thing. Look at various aspects of the product, speed, altitude, low observables, weight, the space inside it, and you manipulate how much of one you get and what it costs you in something else. And you're constantly turning those dials until you find what you think is a magical solution. Magic does happen on, in our design teams, on our projects. Uh, it's unexpected sometimes. It's very rewarding. I mean, there's no greater feeling than seeing what you've worked so hard to develop out there in the flesh. A disruptive technology enables leaps and bounds over what's been done. You're solving very complicated problems that are highly constrained. You have to come up with very innovative solutions in order to do that. There could be ways in which we could mimic evolutionary behavior in the way aircrafts operate, in particular unmanned systems that have a lot of autonomous capability. And if we can embed capabilities for those aircraft to actually learn from what they're experiencing from one mission to another, uh, we can enrich how those aircraft can operate and how, how efficiently they can operate as time goes on. So robotics are at the heart and soul of unmanned aircraft. The airplanes are to a point where they can pass information onto each other, and they're really getting to the point where, where they operate as teams, even without pilots. So the path forward is with a collaborative system of aircraft. Some might be manned, some might be unmanned. Design is where the right brain and the left brain meet each other. As a designer, we're influenced by everything, but what better element to pull from than something that's evolved over time? Birds have shorter wingspans now today because they need to be more aerodynamic to not be hit by cars. That's something that's happened in the last hundred years. I think that the lines between evolution and revolution, and, and, and particularly in our industry, are, are pretty blurred you want to do it's radical so we're still using engineering principles and abiding by those laws but we're doing it in ways that no one expected the technologies are at a turning point for for many areas including unmanned autonomous technologies propulsion technologies airframe construction technologies that, that all of these are coming uh, to fruition to some degree and, and we're maturing them to a point now where we can apply them to new capabilities that we can provide our customers. I think that we're positioned better than anyone on the planet to make aviation history.
So Lockheed Martin Aeronautics today is headquartered in Fort Worth, and just over 20,000 folks work for the company. ADP, Advanced Development Program, also known as the Skunk Works, is about 2,800 folks. The vast majority of those are stationed in Palmdale, uh, about 2,800 folks there. We also have what we call derivative type studies for the products we have, like the F-16 and the F-35, the F-22, C-130, C-5, and so forth. And those are located both at Marietta and Fort Worth. ADP, Advanced Development Programs, really is molded into two different, um, really, organizational aspects. One is the operation side, and that's really the production, advanced manufacturing techniques, those kinds of things. And that's what I'm personally responsible for at the Skunk Works. The other side is more of that visionary, futuristic, what's the engineering? What's in the realm of the possible? What's in the realm of the possible tomorrow, in five years, 10 years, 30 years? And that's the other half of ADP. ADP actually started in, as a result of the German fighter in, in the European theater in World War II. And Kelly Johnson that you see pictured there, he, he approached the uh, leadership of Lockheed at the time in Burbank, and he said, I'd really like to put a design team together, unsolicited, by the way, um, to go design a jet fighter to counter the German uh, ME-262. And he was told, um, we're too busy with the production of the normal airplanes that we're building in support of the war effort. But we will allow you 20 engineers and some back, back space room in the back of one of the hangars, and that's what kicked off Skunk Works. So Kelly took those engineers and he produced what you see there is the P-80, the first production American jet fighter. And it, was, it, was, it all started off in 1943, and literally from paper to flying, you know, in a very short time, we're talking 12, 14 months time, time span, which was, um, even in, by today's standard, is astronomically short, but in that period of time was also extremely short period of time. Lockheed Martin is native Californian. It's been in the state for over 100 years. The original Allen and Malcolm Lockheed actually established a company in 1912 in San Francisco. And they were working on a seaplane at the time. A couple years later, they transitioned their office to Santa Barbara. And that's where Lockheed Aircraft Manufacturing Company actually, the grassroots and the legacy began. Skunk Works has many firsts in support of uh, aerospace. And that's what this chart really represents. Um, just kind of stepping across the chart, you see on, the, on, your, on your upper left the U-2, the first uh, really true high-altitude ISR platform designed in the mid-50s. The first operational mission, 1956, received a Collier Trophy. The next aircraft you see is the legendary SR-71, again designed in the late, early, I would say early 60s. It's the, it still holds today the uh, straight line uh, man speed record over uh, 2,100 miles per hour. And that was established, I think, in 1976. Next to that aircraft, you see a drone, a D-21. That was actually designed in 1964, and that was really Lockheed Martin Skunk Works' first endeavor in unmanned supersonic type of uh, aircraft. Below that, you see also the F-117. Uh, originally, concept started in around the 1975 time frame. It became, uh, its, internet, its initial operational capability occurred in 1983. Up above on the upper right, your upper right, you see the YF-22. That's the first supersonic, a really stealth, as well as supercruise, which is, you can go supersonic without an afterburner, and a highly maneuverable platform. All of that encompassed with a lot of situational awareness relative to all the sensors it carries. So the information that it relates to the pilot as well as to your local community um, is really revolutionary in terms of the way we approach. We call that our fifth gen fighter. And then below that, the F-35, our latest addition. The, that variant you see there is the Marine Corps variant. It's the first supersonic vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, there are three different variants to the F-35. All of the aircraft you see here were originally concepted and designed and all the prototypes built at the Skunk Works. This is what we do. These are the different elements of uh, developing uh, the platforms. I, I think a lot of folks think revolutionary type leaps in industry are kind of serendipitous happenstance. That's not the case. Um, it's very much the rule of 10,000. If you try something 10,000 times, at the end of the day, you're going to figure it out. Um, if you look at all the, mu the music virtuosos, if you look at all the engineering designs, you find that that rule of 10,000 applies. 
And that's really what we do. We look at what does it take, what steps can we take today and eventually evolve in tomorrow. For example, the lift fan on the F-35. The, the really, if you start to peel that onion back and you go back in time, those design elements are traced way back into the mid-1980s before we actually did the first vertical takeoff in 2001. So decades and decades of study, bringing different um, uh, technical subjects together really allows us to leverage those things. We focus on uh, winning, obviously, new programs, developing new prototypes. Uh, we also uh, develop and leverage investments in new technologies, both in terms of internal investments we make as a company, but also along with our, our government partner. And so we talk about and we look at what's the landscape. We look at, we're already looking at the next generation fighter. And what's that fighter going to look like in, to, in 2030? It's going to be, we're finding that it's not so much about the vehicle per se, as it is the system of systems that incorporated on the vehicle. So for example, stealth used to be a discriminator, the F-117. The discrimination was the stealth that it brought. Well, from this point going forward, it's assumed that everybody coming to the game has stealth. It's no longer a discriminator. What's the next thing? What's that discriminator that gets you a leg up uh, on your opponent? We're really finding that it's that systems of systems approach. So it might be, as you heard Tom Spanos talk about in the video, it might be a mix of manned, unmanned type vehicles and the information that they all collect together. How they, how they target and they designate who has what target. How they organize the, the order of battle. How do they relay that information back to uh, your command centers and control centers and those kinds of things. Those are the things that we're really working to identify. We also continue to support the products on hand, the C-130s and the, and the F-35s, and what are those technology roadmaps associated with those vehicles? We keep very much in tune to that, and what do those roadmaps look like? Doing in business in California has its pros and cons. A lot of folks like to live and work in California like myself. However, it's a very expensive state. And so I think we need to, as an industry, we need to look at and focus on what can we do to try to encourage um, keeping aerospace in the state of California. We had some meetings earlier today and yesterday to talk about some of those ideas. And I'm happy to say I've been personally involved last year in some legislation relative to try to incentivize, incentivize the aerospace industry to stay in the state of California. But we need to continue to focus on that. We get a lot of pressures uh, in terms of our business to go elsewhere. Uh, we're also getting pressures to think um, commercially. As the DOD shrinks, there's less budget. We're being asked from a corporate's perspective, what kind of commercial kind of aspects can we pursue? At the end of the day, it's a business, and it all comes down to the bottom line. And we've got to figure out how can we incentivize business to stay in the state of California. And so we need to work together and look at those different kinds of things that would allow that to happen. Lockheed Martin continues to make investments in the state of California. In Palmdale alone, we spent 13%, we, we added 13% more to our budget for Palmdale in terms of Skunk Works and the corporation investment in Skunk Works. And then Lockheed Martin overall made about an 8% increase as a corporation in 2014 in R&D. So the company is a lot more focused on tomorrow and the investment in tomorrow. And I think that's about it. The Skunk Works difference, um, where, we, where we call the impossible becomes reality, we are about taking risk. If you go to Fort Worth and Marietta where that normal mainstream production is, that's kind of a risk adverse environment. We want to produce aircraft. They all want to look alike. In the R&D world, you need to take a little more risk. And in our industry, that's where those technology leaps really come is when, you're, when, you, when you allow yourself to take that risk. Our society, our industry, and the Department of Defense have really become risk adverse. Just in my short career, of 28 years, I grew up in flight test, and, and we would have an accident, let's say, or an, un, an unexpected event occur, but we would probably stop that aspect of the testing we were doing, and we'd continue on to something else the next day. In today's world, it'd be a full stop. Let's find out what happened. Let's, you know, let's make sure we understand everything completely before we move one step forward. And, and there's a reason for that, and we have different tools today that allow us to look at those kinds of things on one hand. On the other hand, if we, became, if we become extremely risk adverse, then we're going to slow way down. And by the way, the competition is not slowing down. The competition relative to DOD type products is speeding up. 
Right now, we're on a pace of about producing one new platform every decade. And I would say those opposed to us are doing a lot more than that. And by the way, if they crash a vehicle and test, guess what? They don't stop tomorrow. They go and fly again tomorrow. So they, they are really hungry to catch up with us. So we just really have to keep all that in the forefront of our mind. And when we look at that R&D, you know, we, we need to take a little more risk than we do in that normal production type of world. And I think that's all appropriate. I think we do have the tools to be smarter for it, be safer with it, but we just have to keep all that on the table as we go forward. Okay, I think that's it. So I'll stick around for any questions, and I appreciate the opportunity very much to speak. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.